the, the pastor said some uh, very nice things about me, highly exaggerated, and I want you to know I did not pay him. <laughs> and he does expect me to tell a joke at the beginning. I came up Okay, it's as good as it's going to get. <laughs> All right. Oh, couldn't hear me? Really? What do I need to do? All right. Is it working? Okay. Well, those of you who couldn't hear, you didn't miss a thing. Um, so the topic, obviously, is managing stress. All of those of you who have had any stress in your life, just raise your hand. Okay. Virtually everybody, the ones who didn't raise their hands, didn't hear the question. Because we all, we all do. Uh, the next slide, please. So this is the definition of stress that the World Health Organization used, and essentially a state of worry or marked tension caused by some difficult situation, and it's a natural human response. We, our brain treats stress as if our life was in danger, so it's the same flight or fright or freeze response that, that's happening, and that's what can cause some negative outcomes. Next slide. This is the famous uh, yerkes dodson uh, bell curve. Basically, what we're looking at, we can see it probably very well, but the horizontal line has to do with activation, how activated you are. And then the one that's going vertically up, that represents your performance. How well can you perform? So like if you're a baseball player and you're going to be up to bat, you're going to have some tension some stress about the fact, am I going to miss the ball, is the ball going to hit me, whatever. So if, if you're just a little bit aroused, not much adrenaline going, you're going to be at the left side of that curve and you're not going to perform very well. It turns out you need a certain amount of activation or stress in order to perform maximally. But as the stress and, and activation keeps increasing, your performance keeps getting better and better until it hits the peak and then it drops off dramatically and you start doing very poorly. So put a different way, some stress is actually good for performance, but too much stress is really bad for performance, but also for your body and your mind. Next slide. So stress is treated as a threat, as if you were uh, dying and uh, in danger of some kind. So your brain's alarm system fires off in less than a second, releases stress hormones, that then affects your body and your mental functioning. And the longer and more strong the stress is, the worse it is for you. Next slide. That's as far as we're going to get with the physiology. So these are just examples of some of the negative effects that chronic or severe stress can have on your body. High blood pressure, you can't sleep, heart disease, you can read them. Uh, it's, it's not a good thing. And these are just examples. Next slide. It also affects you mentally. Depression, irritability, mood changes, low sex drive, you name it, also happen. Next slide. So there are both physical and mental negative effects from excessive stress, either in terms of how much you have or how long it goes on. Now, for some people who are susceptible, when they have sufficient stress, they may develop actually a psychiatric disorder as a result. And I've listed the ones that are in the diagnostic manual. Uh, luckily for you, I'm not going to discuss any of them. But if you have questions about any of them afterwards, uh, I'll be happy to try to answer them. But the point is, it can get bad enough that you actually have a diagnosable mental illness that needs to be addressed. And one of the most common ones is that second one from the top, the post-traumatic stress disorder that, unfortunately, a lot of military come back and they experience that. 
Uh, next slide. So, uh, stress is common. If it's excessive, it's bad for you physically and mentally. So what do we do? How do we deal with, how do we manage what stress we have? Next slide. Now, I'm actually going to cover a large number of things that you can do to limit stress's negative effects. And the reason I do that is no one of them works all the time for everyone. They do work for some people, at least some of the time. But there are enough of them that hopefully you can find one that for you works well for you. I don't expect you to remember all of them for sure. So the number one stress buster has to do with relationships, but specifically it's supportive relationships is what makes a difference. We all need one to three people that we can share with them our deepest, darkest fears and concerns and struggles. And if you have a good supportive relationship with that uh, group of individuals, uh, that is the best stress buster that we know of. And that's been well researched. Don't forget the power of human touch, a hug, a, a, or an arm around the shoulder, whatever, has a very powerful effect also in relieving some of those stress hormones. So supportive people are incredibly important. Now some people are struggling with actually finding enough friends and people in their lives that they can trust and rely on. And they may in fact have a social anxiety disorder that's uh, something that may well need treatment because relationships are so incredibly important. Next slide. So relationships number one. When you're in stress, you really need to pay extra special attention to your physical needs. Adequate sleep, good nutrition, and avoid stress eating. Some people, they gain weight when they're stressed because they start eating and they eat things just make them feel good. Uh, things that cause your dopamine levels to rise, which is the pleasure uh, hormone in your body. Exercise actually is a very powerful and effective way of dealing with stress and helping you physically. Limiting your alcohol intake, not smoking, no illicit drugs. And also good preventive medicine. So. That means seeing your primary care doctor for a checkup, make sure you're okay, get your immunizations that you need, testing that you need, and just doing good preventive care. So you need to take care of your body and your mind because those are the things that can be adversely affected from your stress. Next slide. Now, worrying is something we often do when we're stressed, and we often think about bad things that could happen but haven't happened yet. So one of the sayings we have is that depression is living in the past and anxiety is living in the future. It hasn't happened yet, but we're thinking about what could happen. And it's called time travel. It turns out we can't actually travel into the future, but mentally we try to do that. So if you're worrying about you know, what could go wrong, you know, you're worried that you're going to lose your job because you didn't get your report in on time, maybe the boss will fire me, and they think, oh my gosh, what's going to happen if I lose my job, then how do I pay for my mortgage? And you go on and on down this, this hill. So the first question to ask yourself, well, is it true? Now, it's, in the example I gave, it's conceivable that you could be fired for being late with something, but then you ask yourself, but is it likely? And then you realize, not in the least bit, because it was only one day late. It wasn't a that important a thing. He didn't really chew me out. I just felt badly about doing that. And I have a certain skill set that's critical to the performance of the organization. There's no way they'd fire me, even if I did something much worse. So here I am stewing over something that is so unlikely as to be virtually impossible. And that should help you to calm down at least a bit. Now, it's OK to plan for the future, though. But be here now in terms of your emotional state. Don't, don't live into this imagined future that may never happen. In fact, Yogi Berra taught us this. Making predictions is difficult, and especially about the future. So, be kind to yourself when you're going through all this worry. And definitely don't sweat the small stuff. Now, I first learned this from a cardiologist from Johns Hopkins, or I'm sorry, from Harvard, who uh, got a special interest 
in the role that stress plays in heart disease. And he did a tremendous amount of research on that. And sure enough, he got a heart attack. And he's lying in the coronary care unit thinking, oh my gosh, I could have died. Here I am, a cardiologist, a heart specialist, an expert on stress and heart disease, and I had a heart attack, and I know it's because of all the stress I was experiencing around that time. How ironic is that? And then as he reflecting on it, he said, you know, you really shouldn't sweat the small stuff. And it's all small stuff. When you look at it from the perspective of, I could have died. Right? Also, the stuff that seems so terribly important in your life, like, i got to write one more paper and get it published, or else it's small stuff. So, and then mindfulness, I'm not going to go into that much now, because at the very end, I'm going to actually go through and tell you how you do mindfulness. Next slide. Now, there are times when the stress levels are so high that you actually feel overwhelmed, like you just can't cope with it. And so, you know, you, you feel like there's a catastrophe happening here. Now, you could be in a real situation like that, in a war zone or something of that sort. Although a lot of times when we feel overwhelmed, it's just we've got too many projects going on, and we're struggling with that. So one of the ways to deal with that, that and these are research evidence-based things, is do journaling, where you write down the events of the day, but you'll have to also always include what your thoughts and feelings were about those events. It's just for you, it's not for somebody else to read. And if you do journaling on an ongoing basis and you go back and review them for yourself from time to time, you may notice some patterns of thoughts and behaviors that might be dragging you down and be helped to, to know about. When you're overwhelmed, you should prioritize. These are the 27 things that I think are overwhelming me. Okay, what's really important? What do I need to do because it's a matter of life and death sort of thing? And then just work on them one at, one at a time, going with the most important first. Focus on specifics. Don't overgeneralize. Just say specifically these are the things. That seems to help a lot. And then whatever life situation that you're dealing with that you're unhappy with that you want to, to change in some way, it turns out there are four ways and only four ways that you can deal with them. Next slide. Rada says she likes this one, right? Yeah. So what are the four ways? The first thing is you can leave the situation. Now, if you're going to leave the situation, you have to ask yourself, well, what are the consequences if I do that? So here's an example. Let's say you're in a challenging marriage, and you're unhappy, and you want to decide, what am I going to do about this? Well, one thing is you could leave it. It's called separation and divorce. Well, if I do get separated and divorced, what's the consequence of that? Maybe I won't get to see the kids. Um, there's going to be financial consequences. Just you can list a number of things. So then you ask yourself, well, is leaving that situation worth it given the consequences or not? And if the answer is it's not worth it, then that's not your solution. So now you go to option two, change it. Using the same example, well, how could you change it? Well, maybe we could go to marriage counseling. Uh, or maybe I could react to my spouse differently than I have been. Maybe that would change it. So think about all the ways that you might change it. But then the question is, well, what resources might you need in order to change it? So we mentioned one option was marriage counseling. Well. Does your insurance cover it? Is there a marriage counselor within some reasonable distance of where you live? You know, what resources would be required to make that happen? So let's imagine that you've thought about leaving it and I can't handle the consequences. I don't know how to change it. Now you're left with number three, reframe it. Reframing means that you think about the situation differently so it's less bothersome to you. So, for example, one may way to reframe the problem with your marital struggles is you, you can't leave and you don't know how to change it. You say, well, can I think about it differently? And that is maybe, well, marriages typically go through these ups and downs, and as you change in age and you're dealing with other things, uh, your relationships might, might change. So maybe this is just part of a pattern that we're going through. 
and uh, you know, I don't need to be so stressed about it. That might be a reframe. But the question is how to reframe it, and that one example I gave you might not be a very good one, at least for some people. So you can't leave it, you can't change it, you don't know how to reframe it, you've tried, you thought about it, but you can't. You're stuck with number four. You have to accept it. Because you can't leave it, you can't change it, you can't think of it any other way. So you just have to kind of accept it, and that's where the serenity prayer comes in. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Next slide. Now we'll talk a little bit more about journaling. Here I want to specifically mention something about therapeutic journaling. Next slide. So therapeutic uh, journaling was actually developed by researchers dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder and related conditions. And oddly enough, they found if someone did this, which is to say did this form of journaling for 15 minutes every day, uh, it dramatically improved the post-traumatic stress disorder. So it can be very, very dramatic. So uh, it reduces stress. Uh, remember, it's just for you. And if you're doing therapeutic journaling, it should be kept where no one else could see it and often recommended to burn it once you're done. That way you can feel free to just put everything truthfully on that piece of paper. And there's something magical about you're thinking about something and then putting it on paper that actually changes it for you. So you don't want to just describe what happened, for example, that day, but you need to include your thoughts and feelings about it. So you need to write those down. Now, you don't need to have a solution to the issues that you're writing about, it turns out, the research showed. But if you, you do have a solution, it's fine, and it's okay if they occur to you, go ahead and use those solutions. But that's not what actually improves you. It's the process of journaling that actually works. And again, reviewing your journal may show some patterns that might be useful for you. So journaling is a, is a great technique for, for dealing with stress. Next slide. Resilience, so what is that? That's the ability to bounce back from some kind of stress or challenge in your life. And it turns out there are some people sort of naturally seem very resilient, nothing seems to bother them that much, but uh, most of us uh, aren't quite that way, and luckily though, you can learn how to be more resilient. Next slide. In the military, they actually do that very consciously. You probably have seen pictures in movies of the guys in the mud, crawling. Meanwhile, bullets are flying over their heads. The military does that deliberately and on purpose. Um, they're actually trying to develop what they call stress inoculation, so that in real life, if you're in a battle situation, you won't totally freak out. You have gone through the mud with bullets over your head, and you survived it, and you know what to do and all that. So that's an example of building your resilience. So what are other things you can do? Well, first of all, Avoid some unhealthy coping uh, with the situations in your life, and that makes you more resilient. So that, that stress eating or starting to drink too much alcohol, or that sort of thing, you want to avoid that. Try to get your life in balance. Uh, some people are workaholics and they're at work all the time. They don't give enough attention to their personal lives. That reduces your resilience, your ability to bounce back from whatever problems arise in your life. Learned optimism is one that the uh, psychologist at uh, University of Pennsylvania developed. Uh, they developed a whole field called um, positive psychology. Uh, this was Martin Seligman, the chair, and he said, you know, we're spending all of our time figuring out what do we do with people who are depressed or anxious? Uh, how do we treat them? What kind of therapies to use? But we don't really seem to do anything as psychologists to help people to thrive, people who aren't mentally ill, but just aren't thriving in life. What can we do for them? And that developed the whole field and developed all this research on positive psychology. So we're going to use a lot of their findings here. So one of them is learned optimism. And that's not just, oh, I'll just look on the bright side of things. Um, that doesn't seem to work at least not most of the time. There's a whole book that Martin Seligman wrote called Learned Optimism. Basically what he's talking about, I'm going to really narrow it down, he's saying that what you say about yourself to yourself 
if, if it's not one that supports you in an optimistic way, but rather more negatively, you can learn how to change through the more positive way of thinking about it. So just as a simple example, imagine that you've just graduated from college and you've applied for your very first job and you were turned down, you didn't get the job. If what you say to yourself about yourself is, well, I guess, you know, I'm obviously inexperienced, um, I don't really know enough, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of worthless, basically. That's why I didn't get the job. You could say that about yourself. Or you could say, my skill set actually doesn't really apply that well to that job, I need a different kind of job. You know, I studied business and I know about finance and, and uh, things like that, but that wasn't what this job called for. So I was actually applying for the wrong job. I'm fine, I have a different skill set. So if you think that way, you're gonna be a whole lot less upset than that I'm just a worthless person. And you might be surprised how many think that first way. So Seligman says, you learn to recognize that you are calling yourself names and you have a different way, a learned optimistic way of thinking about yourself and your role in, in life. People do that a lot, actually, especially like people in diets, and they see a, a piece of pie that they really love, and they say, I really shouldn't be eating this, and you can't resist, so you eat that, and, you, and afterwards you're feeling terribly guilty, and you say, I am such a pig. You've just insulted yourself. You're not really a pig, actually. Look in the mirror. Um, but it makes you feel bad. It actually does not help you to get back to your diet. You just say, you know what? Okay, so I, I got off my diet momentarily. I just need to get back on it. One slip does not, you know, make the whole thing go wrong. So that's learned optimism. It can be very helpful. We really should, by the way, treat ourselves as if we were our best friend. But some of us say things to ourselves we would never say to our best friend, you know, like, you're a pig. You don't usually say that to others. So learned optimism, very good. Gratitude is also an incredibly powerful tool to deal with life stresses, but it should be done very consciously then. So Seligman recommends that every evening you think about three things that you're grateful for and kind of reflect on them before you try to go to sleep. And I'll get another specific example later. Learning to self-soothe yourself, um, you know, whether that's taking a warm shower, whether it's getting a massage, whatever it is that's healthy and safe uh, is, is worth doing. Self-compassion, that's, again, more how you think about yourself, but also how you treat yourself. And working on your self-confidence, and agency means that you are not just a pawn on the chessboard of fate. You actually have some control, some mastery over how your life goes. You can change how you think and act, and that affects the way the world works around you. So, next slide. So, what else does uh, positive psychology teach us about stress? Next slide. Generate a positive mood. When you're feeling down or anxious, you can actually generate a positive mood consciously. So, here's what Seligman and his team say to do. First thing is deliberately and consciously engage in enjoyable activities. If you love getting in the swimming pool, get in your swimming pool. If you love playing a game, do that. If you, if you love taking a nap, do that. Whatever you will enjoy, what kind of activity you will enjoy, consciously do that. Revise your goals as needed. If your goals are you're not meeting, reaching them, you're, you're not making enough progress or something, maybe the goals need to be modified. And they found a lot of times that's all that needs to happen. Uh, what also is, is the case, we have a goal, say, to lose 25 pounds. We think, well, when we lost the 25 pounds, we're going to be really happy. And you might be, but usually it's temporary. What's been found is that the greatest satisfaction and happiness comes as you're working towards your goal and if you're making progress towards it. Once you hit the goal, great, and now suddenly that tends to disappear, that happiness, so you need another goal. And sometimes, though, we pick goals that are unrealistic, that, that you know, we really can't do, and we need to just modify the goal to something we can do. 
uh, focus on what matters. They found this is similar to the don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff. And then this is, again, a specific way that they talked about the gratitude. Noticing consciously positive events that occur. And so what uh, Seligman recommends, you're doing this consciously, so you sit down somewhere, close your eyes, and think about something good that's happened to you within the past two days. And just sort of reflect on that. Mostly about how did that make you feel? And then this is the interesting part to me, is then go share that with someone else. You know, I would go to Ray and say, you know what, yesterday this happened and I, this is how I felt. And it turns out when you're sharing it, it magnifies the experience for you mostly dramatically is what they found. And if you do this on a fairly regular basis, you tend to maintain a very positive mood. So it's a very sp specific technique that you can utilize. Next slide. Now, there's also a special breathing technique for dealing with stress and anxiety, and I'm going to describe it here. Next slide. It has an odd name. It's called Exhale Focus Cyclic Sighing. That's because it was done by researchers, and that's the way we talk. Um, but what that basically means, you're going to focus on breathing out, and you're going to be having a cycle, meaning you're going to be repeatedly breathing in and out and focused on the breathing out, but as you're breathing out, you're going to make a sighing expression, like, ah, okay, that's the sighing part of it. So what you do is this is a five-minute exercise. You set a timer for five minutes. Without a timer, after two minutes, you'll think five minutes are up. That's why you need a timer. You slowly inhale deeply as much as you can. And then after you've done it, take another breath. So you go, so to maximize that. And then you're going to exhale slowly while sighing through your mouth. So, five minutes a day for one month or more, a dramatic decrease in the effects of stress and anxiety. So it's a breathing technique. Now, there are multiple breathing techniques that you hear, hear about and read about, but they all can be very helpful. This one, I've seen the research, and it's excellent research and very clear is incredibly powerful. So it's a good one to know. Next slide. More from positive psychology. Distinguishing between meaning and happiness, what, what they find is if your goal in life is to be happy, you're going to struggle with that. Um, you know, there'll be happy moments, but there are going to be some real unhappy moments. What leads to the greatest feeling of satisfaction and value in life is, is if you have a meaningful and purpose-driven life. And so that's what you really want to work for, is what, what is the meaning of my life and what is its purpose, and am I fulfilling that? And if you're not, then you want to change what you're doing so it's more like that. We talked about relationships, positive relationships. Again, incredibly powerful. Can't express that enough. Learning to ask for support or help. Some people, like me, don't ask for help right, that enough, and life would be a whole lot easier if, if, if you do that. Experience versus things. It turns out the research shows that having certain things, even really cool things like a nice, beautiful new car, is not as satisfying in the long run as life experiences, like going on a vacation with your family. Um, so if you want to spend your money wisely for long-term happiness, think about the experiences you might be able to provide for yourself and others rather than buying another thing. You know, some things you need, and it's okay to have things you like and love. But don't forget about the experiences. They're actually more important. And it reminds me of the research that's been done and whether or not money can make you happy. Now, overall, it does not, although people who make less than a lower middle class income are generally less happy than those who have at least that amount of money. We're not worried about whether there's going to be enough food to eat and having a roof over your head. But once those basic needs are met, having more than that doesn't make you any happier. Billionaires are no happier than an average middle class person. However, there are three things you can use money for that does increase happiness. The first and most important one is use your money to help others, charity, whatever. That's incredibly powerful for your own happiness. So you can even be selfish about it and say, 
I'm a selfish person. I want to be happy, so I'm going to give him some money. <laughs> Strange, but true. Um, another thing is to use it to buy experiences. Like if you want to take your kids to Disney World, you can't go for free. Um, but things that you can afford, and there are some things that don't cost anything, going to the library or going for a walk in the woods, uh, that sort of thing. So experiences, uh, that some of them you might want to buy because they do cost something. And the last thing you can use money for that will help with your happiness is buying time. Now people say, how do you buy time? What it really means is that you're paying someone else to do chores that you don't particularly like to do. You can afford to pay them to do it, and that frees up your time to do things that you enjoy more. That actually does increase happiness is what the research shows. So if you hire a company to come and cut your grass so you don't have to, uh, you know, or you have somebody who helps come and clean your house you know, once a week or every other week, whatever, those things can increase your happiness, but they do cost money. So experience versus things. Helping others, I guess we've already emphasized that enough, versus pursuing pleasure. Using uh, your time, your money, your efforts and desires uh, to pursue pleasurable things, you know, a nice meal or whatever, is, does not cause as much happiness as helping others does. And um, that's, that's research evidence-based, so that's part of positive psychology research. And they also find that the environment that you're in makes a big difference about your, your happiness and your, your positive psychology. One way to sort of think about your life planning would be, um, what do I want to do? Who do I want to do it with? And where do I want to do it? So like some people discover, well, hey, I, I'm in love with this person, I want to marry them, so I want them to be with me. I want to be a practicing psychologist. And I realize I don't like big cities, so I really want to be, have a countryside practice. So, and if that's true for you and both of you, then that will optimize your, your positive psychology. The environment matters in very practical ways. Imagine if you're homeless, those are folks we deal with, that's a really rough life. Um, some people love to be close to nature and go for nature walks. That environment is important to them. Others are kind of stuck within ghettos and there are gunshots going off and uh, there's a food desert there. And so your environment makes a huge difference. And to the extent that you can make you know, your environment be more uh, su successful in improving your well-being, the better. Next slide. This is an attitude issue, commitment versus sacrifice. So how do you think about what it is that you're doing? I used to talk to our medical students about this because lucky them, they get to study biochemistry. And what I have to tell you is that biochemistry at the medical school level is very challenging, actually. So you've already had general chemistry and, and uh, organic chemistry, which is usually pretty challenging, but then they throw this at you. So you know you're going to be studying biochemistry on Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening for your Monday test. Meanwhile, your friends that you know went into something else, they're out partying or having fun, doing whatever, and there you are studying biochemistry, and it's not your favorite subject. A lot of memorization involved, but you also have to understand what you're what you're reading, and so you you feel like you know you're making this huge sacrifice. So you're not going to feel that good. On the other hand, if you don't think of it as a sacrifice, but you say, what is my goal? My goal is to become a physician. That, that's, I've been dreaming for that for years. If I become a medical doctor, that's going to be you know, the achievement of my lifetime. But in order to become a physician, I have to master this biochemistry. So the reason I'm sitting here on Sunday afternoon studying it is so that I can become a physician. It's not a sacrifice. It's my commitment. Now, either way, you're going to be studying biochemistry. And you can be there studying biochemistry in sacrifice, or you can be there in commitment. And you're always better off being there in commitment. Next slide. OK, we talked about mindfulness, be here now. 
and this is going to be the last full set of things we'll talk about. Mindfulness is an incredibly powerful approach and method. Uh, it was um, brought into the U.S. from Asia. <clears throat> the guy who brought it here wanted to try it on patients with chronic pain, a very difficult uh, group to, to help. And basically, his bottom line was he found by teaching them mindfulness, their pain experience dramatically decreased. They often could stop taking their pain medicines. And it was so amazing uh, at the university where it was being done that it's now just sort of mushroomed. And it's been found to be very helpful for dealing with stress, anxiety, and so on. So it's a, it's a useful tool, and it doesn't cost anything. Next slide. So what is it? <clears throat> Essentially, you're focusing your attention very consciously and deliberately on your immediate experience. What am I seeing? What am I hearing? What, uh, what am I feeling? Uh, you know, do I feel the air moving in the room? Is it cool or is it warm? Uh, do I smell anything? You know, am I lying on the sand and at the beach? Do I smell the suntan lotion or the ocean uh, maybe gives off some kind of odors at times? What is, what is the totality of my experience? And just focus on your immediate experience so you're not thinking about anything that did happen, nothing that will happen. Just focus on your immediate experience. And you don't try to change it. Just be curious about it. What they call beginner's mind. Act as if you were a child and you've never seen a stone before. Uh, when the first time I had uh, some training with mindfulness, they gave each of us a raisin. You know, just a grape that got shrunk really down, but they have all different shapes and colors and things. And you were supposed to really focus on that and just sort of notice it. And imagine you'd never seen a raisin before. It's going to smell it and so on. So have a beginner's mind. Be curious about, you know, well, why does it look that way or whatever? But do that non-judgmentally. You're not saying it's good or it's bad. So like the people with chronic pain, they weren't going to say, it's good that I have pain or it's bad that I have pain. No, oh, I'm having pain. This is what it feels like. This is where in my body it is. These are thoughts that run through my mind when I have it, but you kind of ignore them. You're not trying to change anything. You're just trying to focus your attention. And, you know, you do that for 10 or 15 minutes, whatever. Next slide. It turns out that when you do that, uh, it can make a dramatic change in, in how you feel and how you're able to cope. So this is one particular model of mindfulness. It's called the SPARK model because it's an acronym, SPARK. So the S is for stopping or slowing down. So you can actually do this sitting down with your eyes closed if you want, but there is a walking form, and uh, you know when I was being trained, we had to do that, walk around, but you're now noticing your environment and noticing what you can see, what you can hear, what you can feel, you know, the temperature of the room, and so on. So you can do that. You can walk in the forest and do it. But imagine that you're like a child. You've never been in one before. And you're, well, look at all that stuff. And you know how kids are so curious. And, oh, look at that rock. And then this. So be like that yourself. Uh, you can perceive by focusing on one specific aspect of it. Be curious. So. Yes, you're noticing sights and sounds and smells and things, but you might want to focus on one in particular that's really caught your attention and be curious about it. And just allow what you experience to be there without trying to change it. And that includes your attitudes and your feelings about it. Just notice them. Oh, when, the, when I'm feeling that, seeing that, I'm feeling a little sad. Isn't that interesting? You're not trying to change it. You're just noticing it. Next slide. So that's the SPIR. The R. Reflect on your experience and be curious about what your reactions are. Why, why did I feel sad about that when I was walking through the woods like this? Usually I feel uplifted. What, what might have triggered that? And you may gain some insights into your mind, your personality, your relationships, and or understand your environment better when you do that. And as you're doing this every day, you're sort of collecting more and more information about your personality and how you respond to things and what matters to you and like that. And that's going to be very helpful and educational. And then the final one, the K, is knowledge is the result. You learn things about yourself that might be important and can even be life-changing when you do this. 
And so it's recommended that you do this every day. A great place for doing mindfulness is if you take a shower in the morning or in the evening. Just really pay attention as you're taking the shower. Well, what does that water feel like? What are the sounds of the water there? What does it sound when you're stepping on the wet floor? What does that soap feel like? What does it smell like? How does it make you feel? You know, really focus on that experience. I mean, you're just taking a shower. Your mind's probably wandering over meaningless things. Why not focus on it? Why not be curious about what you're experiencing and that sort of thing? So that would be mindfulness. Next slide. So one way to practice it, this is just for beginners, you set your timer for five or 10 minutes. Again, without a timer, you're gonna think it's been eight minutes when it's actually only been two minutes. Sit upright and relax in a comfortable chair. Close your eyes, or if you don't wanna do it with your eyes closed, focus on something straight ahead and just keep looking at that, about three feet away from you. And then scan your body from your feet to your head. So notice with your feet, what are you experiencing in your feet? Um, up about your legs and in your abdomen and your chest and your back and your neck and your face and so on. And then after you've looked at everything, as you're checking each of them, if you notice any tension or tightness, let it go, let it relax so that you're, you end up like a rag doll, just no stress, it's no effort at all. You're just letting you know, the chair totally support you. You don't have to exert any effort. And then focus on your breath. Be curious about it. In particular, pay attention to breathing out, exhaling. And just be curious about what that experience is like. And you'll have thoughts that come and go in your mind. Just notice them, don't judge them. Gee, why did I think that? Is that bad? Why? No, you just know, oh, I thought about dinner. Whatever it is, you just gonna let it go. Be curious why that thought rather than another thought. And when the timer goes off, you stop. And that's one way to begin to acclimate yourself to that process of mindfulness. And it turns out it's a very relaxing thing. Remember, you're relaxing from your feet all the way up to your, to your head. You may want to pay particular attention to any tension or tightness in your jaw, because that's the focus of, of stress and tension in your body in terms of your musculature. So you want to let your just jaw hang open as you're sitting there, okay? No tension or tightness in, in the forehead. Everything, all the muscles just loose and relax, just letting your skeletal system support you. You don't have to exert anything. And some people do this before they go to sleep at night and it helps them fall asleep. In fact, some of them can't get through it all before they fall asleep. Now again, I'll forewarn you that this technique doesn't work for everybody all the time. Or for some people some of the time, some people all the time, some people it never does. But it's a very, very powerful technique technique with a whole lot of research support behind it. Okay, the next slide. So that brings us to time for questions and, and comments, if you have comments. The only caveat to remind you is you're only allowed to ask easy questions, nothing hard. Next slide. Um, before you do that, though, I do have a healthcare blog. It's not just on mental health topics. It's actually mostly on general medical things. One of my recent ones was on leprosy. It turns out the incidence of leprosy in the U.S. is going up. Florida and Texas are two of the big states for it, so I thought oh, I'd write a little bit about it. Technically, it's called Hansen's disease, named after the guy who discovered the cause. It's a bacterium similar to the one that causes tuberculosis. And, you know, we all sort of know about leprosy, but we don't usually see it, and most people are shocked because they didn't know it was present in the common era in the United States it is most commonly present in India, so it's all worldwide. The good news is we can cure it. That takes usually one to two years. You have to take two to three antibiotics every day for one or two years, and then it makes it go away. So that's the good news. It's uh, carried by armadillos, by the way, so don't pet any armadillos. Stay away from them. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, uh, so anyway, that's how you access it. T-H-A-R-T-M 01.wordpress.com, if you're interested. So, questions, and I know that Mark has a microphone, which um, would be helpful for you to use that so everybody can hear what your question is, okay?
They're right here, Mark. <clears throat> yep. Thank you. Yeah, my question is, um, does age or sex male versus uh, female have a, what effect does that have on stress? Yeah, so didn't everybody hear his question? So I don't have to, okay, so I don't have to repeat it. So age does, does make a difference. Um, it turns out our uh, resilience and our sense of agency decreases beginning around age 50. So the older you get, the less agency you feel. And it's thought that's probably due to the fact that our bodies aren't getting better, our minds aren't getting better, we become more forget as the older we get, and that does affect our attitude towards our capabilities. Um, women are, are now these are average statements, it doesn't apply to everybody, but women are more susceptible to anxiety and certain forms of stress. So for example, women in the military have a much higher incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder than male military members do. And it's probably because that sensitivity was intended for them to be very uh, vigilant and protective of babies and young children because that was years and years ago, that was one of their primary responsibilities. And so Mother Nature made it so that they're highly sensitive to those things. Other questions? There's somebody back there. Okay, so we know that exercise is important to reducing stress. Have mm -hmm. you, can you share any research that says what the best exercise is and the duration needed in order to see improvements? Mm -hmm. For the purpose of dealing with stress, now it doesn't decrease stress, but it decreases the negative effect of stress. So, in fact, for some people, they get so into exercise that they drive themselves crazy and that becomes stressful. So you don't want to do that. But typically, aerobic exercise is the form of exercise that's best for you know, stress reduction, the response to stress. Aerobic is using large muscle groups more or less continuously for a period of time, like running, walking, swimming, that sort of thing. Anaerobic exercise is where like weightlifting and that sort of thing. Um, now that's very helpful to combine the two of them in terms of your general health, so I do highly recommend that. Um, what you wanna do with, with the aerobic exercise in terms of the stress protection thing is 30 to 45 minutes at least four times a week. You, we talked about, uh, or you talked about like relaxation type mm -hmm. techniques. What about guided imagery? Do you, do you think that's a, a good tool to use for mm -hmm. decreasing the, stress? The, the simple answer is yes, absolutely. And there is good research about guided imagery and, and other sorts of meditation related kinds of things that are brought to, to us mostly from the East, but they are very, very powerful. And Mindfulness is actually borrowed from a lot of those techniques, but it's more, made more specific. Back there. Yeah. Uh, sometimes when I go to think I've got somebody to talk to about all my problems, they take over the conversation and tell me about all their problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. You got any suggestions for that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm sure that happens to all of us from time to time. You think you got problems? Well, listen to mine, right? <laughs> well, now you do it worse, huh? Um, one, of the, one of the things that I do say is that what goes over your head won't get under your skin. So what, what you have to learn to do is to hear other people's problems, uh, but not let it get to you emotionally to excess. You need to understand them, and they need to feel understood. And so there's actually a whole technique called active listening that, uh, that you can use that, that really is helpful to the other person. And what you can do is, if this is somebody that you know and care about, and that's why you're sharing your problems, is to share this issue with them. You know, when, when I want to tell you about an issue or problem I'm having, you want to share yours too. Could we just alternate and take turns if that's what works better for you? Um, and I'm not asking you to solve my problem, unless you know a solution. I just want to be understood and have somebody else that I care about 
knows truly what I am feeling and experiencing. But I can see where it can, could be a problem. If, so it's difficult if, uh, for somebody to have empathy. Yes, you can't make them have empathy. Um, but you can help train people yeah, if they're willing to be trained to be more empathic. Because there, these, these are formal steps to what you do for active listening. It's actually very powerful. Occupations? Yeah. What about occupations? Oh, st stress. Yeah, stress can certainly be higher in some... Yeah, I'm sure that... I'm told that for police officers, um, their, their work is uh, like 95% boredom and 5% sheer terror. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that could be boring and then terror could be a tough one. Uh, being in a war zone can be tough if you're in military. Um, other people have much easier jobs. Doctor, with, uh, with regard to Eleanor back there, I'm, I'm so grateful for Eleanor. She's been, talk about gratitude. Mm. That's the picture that comes to mind when I think of gratitude is Eleanor. Um, she's got it. Mm -hmm. Would this be helpful? Because with active listening and sometimes what, when I'm doing premarital or marital counseling um, is have an object that the person holds. And while they're holding it, they're talking and the other person's mm -hmm. listening. And then to give it to the other person, uh, and and while they're holding it, and, and that simple object sometimes can be helpful. And I'm wondering, are you listening? Can you hear me, Eleanor? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. I don't know. Is that something you could introduce that would be helpful if yeah. someone has a propensity to just talk about themselves and say, mm -hmm. "This would be helpful for me if we if if we did this because I also need to yeah. get some things out, sure. and I'm trusting sure. you to do that." It, it sounds like a very good idea. Uh, generally, when, when we're teaching our residents and things about doing active listening, like with patients, you, you're, you're not supposed to be sharing your problems with them. You want to know what theirs are. And it's a very conscious and deliberate thing to do active listening. You really are setting aside all judgment. You're not deciding, well, what they're saying or doing is good or bad. I just want to understand what it is. And so you ask questions to clarify it. When you think you understand it, then you repeat it back to them. This is what I think you said to me. If they say, well, no, it's not, then keep going until you get it. And that's a very powerful experience for someone to know that someone actually heard and understood them. And then if you have some suggestions, don't just say, here's my advice. Say, would you like my advice? And if they say no, then don't give it. Some people just want to be heard. They don't want advice. And we also tell the residents, don't deny the problem. Like, what's an example of denying a problem? You come to me and you say, I'm very worried about my relationship with my dog. And you say, don't worry, it'll all be fine. You've just told them, no, you don't have a problem. Well, how do you know? <laughs> you know, you've... you've preemptively said it's not a problem. So what are you talking, you know, like if you say, don't worry, it'll be fine. And we often do that to people. I'm so worried about going to see the doctor. Don't worry, it'll be fine. You don't know that. You don't know what the doctor's going to find. So that's denying that it's a problem. Um, don't tell them that whatever the thing they want to bring up is, well, it's all your fault. That's not usually a good thing if you want to actively listen. <laughs> So there are certain things you, you do and certain things you don't do if you want to actively listen. And you can do that with anyone, but it's a deliberate process, and it's not appropriate for all the time when you're talking. Just, just not. But that's a great idea. I actually had never heard that one before, but it makes sense. Well, that wouldn't be with active listening. Yeah, no, but it's that's with this other, yeah. Like yeah. Yeah, no, I, it sounds like a great idea. And I guess that's your experience with premarital counseling is that's very effective. Or even if you've done it in youth groups too. When oh, you're okay. Talking to that person who is holding the object mm -hmm. and listening to them. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what did you say? Oh, I was just throwing in there. It's like the phone call to the Lord of the Flies. Oh, the Lord of the Flies. Remember that story? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The danger that I can think of with that is if the other person isn't listening, you might be tempted to throw it at them. <laughs> I, 
that's never happened, though. <laughs> no sharp corners, right? Yeah. <laughs> huh? What? Bob? Bob? I can't hear you, Bob. I can certainly talk. I know you can, but we don't. It's okay. Okay, I'll talk real low now. Huh? Um, quite often, our biggest problems are with the people that we love the most. Uh, and that seems like an irony on one hand, but is it really an irony? Because that's who we spend the most time with, that's who we let our hair down with but it's also who we run into problems with because we have been vulnerable with them. So everything that I saw that you expressed today, I think was coming toward how you can be if this is affecting you negatively. But I think there's a component here where we have to learn how to, and I know I'm guilty of this for sure. No comments, please. <laughs> Uh, I'm constantly trying to uh, justify things in terms of how I feel about them as opposed to truly giving the other person uh, at least a completely fair shake in the interest of, I guess, negotiating in good faith. We always tend to come from, well, this is how I feel and this is why I think I'm right and this is how I can go about justifying myself. But the, another component of this is, I think, being fair and trying to have an accurate self-analysis of yourself going into dealing with these people that you love the most. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll become too set in your ways and you actually, uh, not that this applies to me, you actually drive people away from you. If, mm -hmm. if you don't accept that they have a point of view while you're trying to work on your point of views, whether they're correct or not. Mm -hmm. You have to accept theirs and look at theirs at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's good. It's, there's that saying, and what he could, the gift he gave to see yourself as others see ye. Uh, if, if you're willing to have an open mind that you don't know yourself perfectly, other people can notice things about you that you don't know that would be good to know, and just, just have the humility to say, I don't know everything about myself, and be open to what are they observing? And uh, if people do it in a kind way in an attempt to help you, that's part of what a good relationship should be about. But you have to be willing to hear it, even if it's not good news. But it's for your own sake some of the time. Sometimes it's for their sake or someone else's sake or everyone's sake, you know. But. Now, everyone probably didn't hear it, so just, he's talking about in catechism class where they have you draw a picture of yourself and then have other people say how they see you, and I'm sure it's eye-opening, you know, yeah. Anything else? Okay. If not, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'll wait here a little bit afterwards in case somebody has an individual question that they just thought of. By the way, uh, Pastor said someone had told him that they are really expert at causing stress. And, and so what I thought of was, you know, when, when you go in to see your doctor and you say, when I do this, or don't do that. So that's what I would say to the person, well, don't do that. <laughs> okay, thank you again. Have a good one.